All right, I know everybody has a busy schedule and we're already four minutes behind. So I'm gonna start and hope that Bijou can hop back on if that's okay with everyone else here. Um, just gonna call the meeting to order for the Human Rights Commission for the city of Iowa City today on June 27th at 5.34 p.m. Uh, we're gonna start with roll call and my last name is towards the top. I'm Jessica Andino and I'm here. Uh, just say if you are here, Adele Adams. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Ashley Lindley. Here. Roger Lusala. Here. Bijou Maliavo. We'll be right back. Uh, and then uh, Mark is not here. Jason is not here. Tony. I am here. Excellent. Tony, I would just butcher your last name. And so I hope that's okay. I'm not trying to be rude. Um, right now is the time in which we will be able to take public comment for any items that are not on the agenda. Um, you can access the agenda online. And as you can tell, we're still in Zoom meeting platform. So that means that you must raise your hand in order to talk. Um, in order to do that, there's the raise hand function within Zoom, or you may hit star nine if you are attending on the phone to let us know that you would like to speak. Uh, commentators shall address the commission for no more than five minutes at a time, and commissioners shall not engage with the, within discussion with public commenters concerning said items. Um, but if you would like to uh, comment on an item that is on the agenda, uh, you'll be able to do so as we get to those items within the agenda through that same mechanism of just raising your hand or star nine. I'm sorry, Jessica, can we do the approval of the minute of the minutes? Yep, that's, oh, sorry, I did skip that. I went, I went far, you are correct. I was just skipping. So I went from item one to three and now we're hopping back to two to be able to do the approval of the May 25th minutes, which I feel like just happened. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like we were just doing this like last week. Um, those minutes are located within the packet, I believe on page three. Thank you, Kristen, for putting them up on the screen. There we go. Um, we can provide discussion or we can have a motion to approve whatever commissioners feel is appropriate at this time. I move to approve the minutes. They looked great to me. Yeah, I'm second. Second. Okay. First by Ashley, second by Adil. Um, we don't need to do full roll call, but we'll do if you, um, oh my goodness, I'm so tired. Uh, motion to approve, say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Those abstaining say aye. Motion passes. I believe we have five commissioners to zero at the moment. Yes, that's how math works. There are five of us. Okay. And that was Ashley and a deal. Correct. Oh, okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah, go by first names. It's just easy to do. <laughs> I hope that's okay with you, Kristen. Oh, of course. Okay, excellent. Well, and as you can see, we have an additional panelist that has joined us. Oh, and now even another one. I believe that would be Bijou hopping on again. I'm so sorry. I, I had an urgent call. Sorry. <laughs> Yo, you're a-okay. I'm glad that you were able to join us again. Um, we are moving along to item number four on our agenda today. If any public, again, would like to speak um, to or about Daisy Torres, who is gonna be talking with us today, who is the police department liaison, um, they may do so at this time. And other than that, if there is no public comment upon her joining us, I'm gonna let her take it away. Daisy, you should have the power to unmute yourself, I believe. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. This is the second time I get to join all of you. The first time I think was Roger's first day on the commission. So I, thankfully I had uh, the opportunity to hear a little bit of, about each of you. Um, but I believe there are a few of you I haven't met before. So my name is Daisy Torres. I'm the community outreach assistant for the Iowa City Police Department. I am a non-sworn civilian person at the PD. Um, so that means I'm not an officer. I'm just me, this is, you can't see what I'm wearing, but I wear normal, formal clothes. Um, and my main, some of my main duties right now include community outreach initiatives, um, representing the PD on a couple other commissions, such as the community partnerships, preventing child abuse and preventing child abuse at Johnson County, along with a couple others. And I am excited to be here. I, I believe my main, duty here is just to listen 
and see if there's any collaboration points between the commission and the police department. Also, if there's ever anything that comes up in the meeting that I know we could do better in. So if any issues come up, I can definitely take those up with the right people. Um, so I'll be honest, I'm not in charge of anyone, um, just for myself. And even then I do have a supervisor, um, but I can always make sure to get any issues or concerns to the right people and follow up with it. But my main job is just to see um, if the PD can be in any help or any way. I saw some of the exciting things on the agenda. Um, and if there's anything that you see, oh, maybe we can have the PD help with this or um, yeah, any point of collaboration because that is my outreach duties. Um, but yeah, that is me. That's kind of it, short and sweet um, to get you guys going along. Excellent, Dave. Thank you. I'm going to open up to commission members if we have any questions for you. Hope you're ready to, to get to bat, okay? <laughs> so where do you work? At uh, the police department or at the court or where is, where is her location? Yeah, so normally the community outreach office is stationed out of the Robert A. Lee Rec Center downtown. But due to COVID and staffing shortages, there's no officer in the community outreach position where I'm normally paired up with. So right now I am working out of the police department over at City Hall. Um, but until we get our staffing up and we have an, a formal officer in our regular specialty position, we'll head back over to the rec center. But for now, um, I'll be over at City Hall. Okay, thank you. I have a question, Daisy. Do you mm -hmm. find yourself in any uh, situation where you have to respond to police call by, you know, to be that liaison with the community or no? Um, I've done it a couple of times, mainly if it's been um, a situation where, so for example, I speak Spanish. Um, so if it's a situation where they may need someone that speaks Spanish, I am there sometimes, um, or if it's a situation where they would feel more comfortable talking to a woman, because unfortunately we don't have a lot of females on the PD side, um, as an officer. So sometimes I get to do that, but in terms of a civilian responding with officers, not, not really, if anything, um, if I'm out and about doing something and I see that the one time I was assisting over at the daycare center that the city put on during COVID uh, for city employees, I, uh, I found a lost toddler. So if anything, I had to call police to help me find and put her back to where she needed to go. But um, I don't get to respond normally. I get to focus on my main outreach duties. Uh, my second question is, does the, what is the, the work that the Iowa City PD have been doing with the guide link. Are you guys here? Yeah. yeah, so I know we are in the process of hiring or they were interviewing, I believe a couple weeks ago, the mental health liaison that community yep. will be having and the partnership will be pretty close. I'm not positive on logistics and details as to how that relationship will work, but I do know that they are working on getting point people set up. So hopefully that that person can help us either divert people to the guideline center or divert community resources versus the jail or the hospital. Um, but we do work pretty closely with the guideline center. So my sergeant that's in charge of me serves as uh, as another PD liaison on the guideline center board or commission. So he kind of gets to see if there's anything um, behind the scenes that might work a little better if we did it another way, or if there was something that he's seen officers be a bit confused about. Um, so we're doing our best and figuring out what is the best way to manage our relationship with the guide link because it is still very new. Mm -hmm. And there's very a few instances where we're like, well, we didn't think this all the way through. So what, how can we approach this collaboratively and fix this together? Um, but it has been a very good symbiotic relationship the PD's building with GuideLink. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Uh, also, 
I know in this uh, town there is a lot of uh, domestic violation or domestic violence. So you deal just with uh, child abuse or also with domestic violence? Uh, so the child abuse boards are just boards I get to serve on. Um, I don't get to do a lot of our victim outreach. That would be Anne, our victim services coordinator. I do uh, sometimes get to assist and that's really if I'm not busy. Um, but our victim services coordinator deals with everything and anything that comes through the PD. So I know she's had quite a lot of domestic violence survivors come through and she does do her best to put them with the right resources. Uh, she does everything from like robberies and burglaries to identity theft and fraud. She does everything, anything that might have any sort of victim or survivor, they'll get put in touch with her. Thank you. Daisy, I, I had a question because I had reached out to you prior um, in a different capacity with the uh, Coffee with the Cop program, right? Um, and previously when we did the meet and greets uh, prior to hiring the new police chief, uh, the chief Liston talked about, you know, police involvement programs, specifically he mentioned a few um, in the school districts in which he was formerly associated with. Um, do you have, other than the Coffee with the Cop program, does the PD have any established reoccurring outreach in specific neighborhoods or, or diverse neighborhoods? And do you foresee more programming similar to that um, now that uh, vaccination rollout is happening and COVID is subsiding a little? Yeah, so I would say established and specific ones uh, would be coffee with the cop. We do national night out on a pretty consistent basis last year because of the pandemic, we didn't do it. Um, but we're looking at getting sites hosted and up and running again this year. Um, we do our best to make sure they're at different locations throughout the city. And we do our best to hit up all of them um, because it is a good problem to have sometimes when there are a lot of sites. So coordinating that will, will be my job this year. Um, and we're trying to do our best to do more outreach things now that COVID's slowly phasing out. Obviously, it's not gone. It's still very much real. Um, so that still does limit a bit with what we can do. But we do have officers regularly attending some of the bike rides that a couple, uh, I think we've gone to three of them now over at the South District. Um, he'll do a couple of those. and. In terms of other established things, I was working on getting a few more of those when I started. So a little bit about when I started was September 2019. So I only had about six months on the job before COVID happened. Um, there were a lot of things that I wanted to get started and begin as an initiative at the police department and it, the world just stopped everything. So um, that's what I've kind of been working on the past couple of months is getting back in touch with some of the folks um, because there are a couple things I would like to get going. So before COVID stopped everything, we were putting together a first respondum forum, first responders forum for immigrants and refugees, just so that they can know what to expect from fire, police, EMS. Um, because for folks that come from a different community, you don't know, like one, a different community, you don't know what's gonna happen. But if you come from a whole nother part of the world, things run very differently. Like my grandparents that lived in Mexico when they came here, they're like, I really didn't think the firefighters did that here. Like they were so confused um, and helping bridge the gap between what we expect of the community versus what they actually know, because that gap can be pretty big for some. Um, and finding the best ways to facilitate that conversation where, yes, um, where you came from, first responders had a very different role, but here it is very different as well. Um, and making sure that folks aren't hesitant to call 911 because they think they have to pay, or if they think if the firefighters come in, they're like gonna have to knock down the door or be worried about like, oh, this thing keeps beeping at me. So I'm just gonna take it out of the ceiling, not knowing it's a very important smoke detector. Um, so getting small answers like that 
to folks because half the time they don't know it's something they don't know and we never one ever if no one ever bothers to tell them how are they going to know um so that was something that i would i had in the works and hopefully we can get that going by early or late spring next year seems kind of ambitious but we're gonna try um there is also a safety check well more of a car light check um, we're gonna have going at the end of July, which will be part of our bulbs program. So our bulbs program, if an officer pulls you over, it's a voucher where that person can go ahead and get um, any burnt out tail light, tail light or headlight um, on the car fixed for free. So they don't have to pay anything. So have something like that where folks can bring it through. We can check them to see if they have any light out. Um, and we can give them a voucher so they can get that fixed. Because sometimes it's COVID's been hard with everything. Folks sometimes are just really financially hard or come on hard times. So anything we can do to kind of help reduce um, any type of impact. Because sometimes, like even just having one headlight can really affect visibility. Um, so any reduction in traffic accidents would be helpful. Um, and then it's just as things come up. So if an organization wants a presentation of any sort or um, there's a group that wants to collaborate on an event, we, we don't say no. So um, yeah, I would say those would be some of the things we hope to accomplish and the few things we already have established. But we do have rooms to grow. It's just right now it's been kind of tricky with staffing and COVID. Uh, Daisy, thank you so much, actually, for bringing all that up. <laughs> I, I have a lot to say, but I, I think I'll contact you personally for it. But for the smoke alarm, I believe it's also good if you contact the landlord mostly, but because, you know, like they pay the rent to them and you might come and help. And I said I might be wrong and Roger can tell me I'm wrong, but I'll say 90 percent of African homes, the smoke alarm, every time you call, you hear the beep. It's, it's like a song in a house or it's music in a house. They don't understand that you have to check if the battery, the battery is low or it's dead or something. To them, it's normal, you know? When they first move in, it's not there, it's okay. But then when you start beeping, it's like a sound every day. Every day you hear it. And they don't understand that it's a problem. So working with, I mean, if you, let's say Pheasant Ridge, you're not going to go to every single uh, apartment and <laughs> let them know about it but if you talk to like the landlords every time they do a monthly check or something I think they'll listen to them more than you because they have to pay rent to them so when the landlord said you know you have to pay rent or you have to abide by these rules otherwise you leave I think they'll be the one they'll, they'll take it more seriously than if that, that's just my opinion than if you come in as an officer like you know this is wrong you know this is good they'll get it but if they know they're not gonna get kicked out of their home <laughs> because of a smoke alarm or something, it, it's gonna continue beeping. Um, so that's just my suggestion on that one part. Yeah, of course. And thank you for sharing that. Um, I know the fire department has also been trying to do a couple of these things. Like they've been trying to do smoke detector, kind of like safety or just reminding folks like, um, if you hear the beeping, that means it's time to change the battery. But as you said, there's folks in our community that are just like, nah, it's just making new noise. It's not nothing new to me now. Um, so that type of education is important because even a couple of, uh, of our community members didn't know what a fire extinguisher was. So even really basic education like that is super important. Um, so working with our fire and our EMS folks um, to get that information to our community is something I'm trying to work on. I have a, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go back, Daisy, on when you talk about the tail light and headlight voucher. I know in the past, I don't know if the city has uh, put voucher at uh, places like direction or when people can pick them up and things like that. My question is, and always my worry as well, when people get pulled out for those tail light, do they have to go through the whole process of checking license and all that stuff before they get the voucher? So 
the vouchers are so the only time they do get passed out is when folks are pulled over. Um, I believe our traffic. Well, our, I'm trying to think. Basically, what we can pull over as a traffic violation has changed. So I believe yeah. mechanical things are now a secondary reason. Exactly. Um, yeah. So right now, the only reason they would be getting pulled over to begin with would be if they're speeding, okay. they ran a red okay. light, things like that. And once they've pulled them over, they see that, oh, you also have a burnt out taillight. That's when they would be given the voucher. Okay. So right now, um, they wouldn't be pulled over just for that. I was just uh, clarifying that because I know when uh, uh, Captain Brotherton, I think when he was the interim police chief, that's when we changed our ordinance about people not being pulled over for mechanical failure because that always leads to yet, you know, the police officer pulling people over for things that are not really a big violation, then it escalates to something that it is a big violation. So that's always the worry. Uh, for me as a commissioner. So I wanted to make sure that we clarifying that uh, police officers are not going to be pulling people over for mechanical failure. They're supposed to pull them over for the violation of speeding, running a, running a red light as a secondary. If they have a mechanical issue, then they'll get the voucher to get it fixed. But it won't be the primary reason why people get pulled over. No. So, okay. um... I should probably clarify a little bit more. So the checkup on the lights will be an event. So towards the end of July, we'll have um, kind of a little station set up at Riverfront Crossings Park. Uh, and folks can just come through. We can make sure all their lights are working. And if one of them does happen to be out, we will just give them a voucher and they can go get it fixed. So they won't, uh, like it won't be a, a traffic stop of any sort. Like we'll make it very obvious it's a community event. Um, because we do want to make sure our bulbs program is being advertised, but at the same time, we want to make sure the primary reason behind it is that folks are being safe. Um, so this would be more of a community event versus um, what we're doing with traffic violations. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, I didn't clarify it very well, but that will be an event towards the end of July, either the 20th or 23rd. Um, but I will double check on those dates. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions, commissioners? Not hearing any, Daisy, I would expect to get a lot of emails, just so you're aware from every commissioner individually. So if you could pop in your email, oh, I don't know if we have a chat anymore, Never mind. Uh, your email should be one of the city department emails, is that correct, to the ICPD? Oh. I think we may have. I believe her email is through the ICPD, so you should be able to find it via the any members of the public do wish to reach out to Daisy. So we are moving along to item number five on our agenda. Okay, everyone. Um, which is a funding request for the diversity market. Um, put in by, I believe, the South District Neighborhood Association, which you may find um, on page nine of the packet. Angie Jordan put this in to ask for uh, recurring events, um, one, two that have already happened, one that will be the next Saturday, and then the following two Saturdays after that, um, that are happening over at the Kingdom Center in the South District. Requesting amount is $2,000 is, oh wait, no, the total amount of funds requested is $2,000, yes. I, believe. Uh, I have a oh, couple of notes from Stephanie. Um, yes. Several of the dates that they are talking about um, are not, they've passed already. Mm -hmm. So, um, you should be considering just the three markets that are after this meeting. So there's okay. the ones on um, June 12th and June 19th are already passed. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then there is a market on 
June 26th, that falls, that still falls within the um, fiscal year 21. Mm -hmm. uh, and the commission has $2,000 a year to spend on sponsorships. So, um, and I have a note that you've spent less than, or about $500. So you've got about 1500 left for fiscal year 21. Um, Correct. And if you break, if you look at the budget in the um, agenda attachments, they break it down for $200 a weekend for a bouncy house and $200 a weekend for face painting. So that's basically $400 for each market. And um, that would mean the, that if you decide to sponsor it, the June 26th one would be $400 out of fiscal year 21. And then the um, July 3rd and July 10th ones would be eight, a total of $800 out of fiscal year 22. Um, and then sponsorship is also reimbursements. So if they are awarded funding, they'll have to submit receipts and invoices paid and then we'll reimburse for the costs. So the two, the round number of $200 probably isn't the exact number. It's probably something like 178.42, you know, so they'll, they'll do the receipts and um, the actual number will get worked out later. Kristen, can you clarify if the South District does not submit their invoices by the end of fiscal year 21, we can still allocate the funds back for that single date, or is that not possible? I am not sure. Okay. Um, I, think, oh. I think there's a reasonable amount of time because, you know, July 1st comes and yeah. bills are still being paid for the yeah. previous month. Yeah. I, I would think that there's a reasonable amount of time for them just to um, submit those, but I don't know 100%. I mean, I can but, text Jordan and, and you know, harass <laughs> right. him. Yeah, I think usually when it's incurred, so it will be, the, 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 the expense will be incurred on that 26. So they yeah. might not get a bill from whoever they're renting until July 3rd, but the date was, the, the events happened and the expenses were incurred will be the 26th. So I think the city will be fine to pay it, even if okay. it comes on July 15th. But as long as it happened on the 26th and we have the bill for the 26th. That's I believe, my understanding on that. I think the invoice date will have to be within June though. I do yeah. believe the invoice date will have to be within June. If, if we're wanting just to allocate it to the 2021 funds that for that $400, which I'm sure she can get on an invoice from, from whoever is providing these services. Yes. You know, I, I'll be supportive of allocating that $400 for the 21 fiscal year and uh, allocating the $800 for the 22 fiscal year because that leaves us about $1,200 for the remaining of the 22 budget year, which we just beginning, we're just gonna start. So we don't know what other requests we'll get. Uh, for the 2021, we only spent so far $500. So do we lose whatever we were budgeted or can we yeah. move it forward? It poofs, it goes poof. Because in other things that we also had in our agenda that we haven't really discussed much, it was the request from the Coralville Pride, which we sent them to go ask uh, the city of Coralville. So, but if we don't, if we didn't get anything, I don't know, Kristen, if you have anything from them. If not, then they're gonna lose their opportunity. Well, um, that was changed. There was a sponsorship request that is now changed to um, basically just do, does the commissioner want to be a vend the commission want to be a vendor. Oh. Uh, so that also in July, correct? Which would not be within twenty one either. Twenty one either. Right. Sorry about it. Uh, finishing this one, I will be in favor of allocating the $400 for the last weekend in June. And uh, 
uh, maybe picking up another weekend in July. That way it leaves us some money for the remaining of the fiscal year. So Roger, are you putting a motion on the table? I will motion we grant the fund in a 21 fiscal year for the $400 remaining. And uh, we also pick up another weekend in July for the $400. So that'll be $400 for fiscal year 21 and $400 for the fiscal year 22. I'll second that. So motion by Rogers, second by Bijou. Um, do we need further discussion from other commissioners or are we okay with taking a vote? If you want to further this discussion, you may speak now. Sounds like we're gonna to go to a vote on Roger's motion of 400 for fiscal year 21 and 400 for fiscal year 22. All commissioners that are in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. And those abstaining say aye. Looks like the motion passes. I believe we have six commission members to zero. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Sometimes math is hard, guys. So six zero. All right. Um, Kristen, anything else regarding that, or can we move on to number six? Nope. I think it can go on. Yeah. Trying to keep it moving. You let me know if I'm messing up. Okay. <laughs> you got it. All right. Um, so as Kristen alluded to earlier, we're on to item number six on our agenda. Again, if any members of the public would like to speak to any of these items, please raise your hand or dial star nine on Zoom or your phone, excuse me. Um, this is for the Corville Pride. And as Kristen had mentioned, does the commission want to be a vendor at this event, which is taking place noon to 8 p.m. on Sunday, September 5th um, in the IRL area, is that correct? I believe so. Um, Kristen, do you have any other information regarding this or is it in our packet that I missed? Um, no, let's see. I got a, um, email. It looks like uh, that's about it. There's the cost is $50 and being a vendor means having a table and being an educational resource. Um, and the commission members really have to commit to being there um, and no more than four people but they don't they haven't said yet whether um, they're providing the tables and chairs but that wouldn't be hard of course <laughs> um, but we don't have any other information besides that does the office of equity have those really great freebies to hand out and all of that fun jazz uh, of course we do oh. <laughs> we have swag yeah. everybody okay. likes swag yeah yep. and we have bags for the swag that's right <laughs> really right, cool bags, bags. <laughs> is any Oh, I was just going to say, is anyone opposed to the commission being a vendor, not looking at availability, but is anybody opposed to the commission as a whole being a vendor? No, I think the more we can spread the love, the better. And wherever, if we can do it, I'm always uh, for that. As of a person living present, I will be out of the country on that day, so I cannot come in. Okay. Typically how we've done these events in the past, we've taken um, the block, we've made blocks of either two hours or three hours and we've had two commission members sign up at a time. Um, that's kind of right, actually how this has gone down before and Bijou as well, you know how this goes. Um, I have done a Google sheet before where we all sign up for different shifts. It could be those, yeah, noon to two, two to four, four to six, and six to eight. Um, I am unaware if Corville Pride mandates us to be at the entire event of noon to eight. Um, sometimes they're allowed to leave early. I don't know the rules here. Um, yeah, so. I'm not sure either. I have a information that the gates open at 11. Um, okay. 
so it might be a little longer than noonday with the gates open at 11, but it's also the first major gathering of LGBTQ plus communities since 2019. So it will probably be well attended, I would think. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, be able I'm, to commit. Uh, I won't be available to commit, but I'm, I'm in support of it. I'm in support of it as well. Yeah, it just I mean, I won't. I can't out. commit either, but uh, I'm, I support it. I'll be playing gay softball during that time, so. <laughs> So it sounds like either way we can, whether we have a, I mean, we'd like to have a physical table if we have enough individuals to station that table. Either yeah. way, we could pay the $50, which would be a potentially just a donation either way. And we can yeah. kind of refigure schedules, maybe buy to look at September. Would that be a possibility, Kristen? No, um, my schedule that far out. <laughs> yeah, you know, if nobody can staff the table, well, you know, you still you still have a vendor spot. Um, yeah, I guess basically Stephanie left notes that um, if you have a table, you pr you pretty much have to be present at the table. Yeah. So if there aren't people to staff it, then you know it would just be kind of paying the fifty dollars could we potentially push a decision on this back until july when some folks might be a little more aware of their availability and hopefully we have more information about whether or not they need the vendor there for the entirety of that eight or nine yeah. hours that seems like a really long time for a vendor fair but yeah. i don't know well, it is a whole, it's a, it's in a whole pride event. So it's not like, like it's just a vendor fair. It's the vendors will be available through the whole pride event. So, yeah. Is there a deadline to respond to this request? It um, doesn't really say. I'm sure from an organizer standpoint, the sooner the better they would rather know, but. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't doctor schedule for the fall yet, you know, things like that. <laughs> I, I support the event, and uh, if we can find people to mend the table for a couple hours, it's better than none. But I don't know if ever any event requires you to have that table from 11 to 8. That seems like a long time to commit. So I support it, and maybe we need to find, to ask the question, how long that can somebody be there? Do we bring our own table? Or can we give them some strides to give out during the parade or something? Mm -hmm. So those are all good questions. So. I have a, I have another thought also. I'm wondering if it would be possible, since it sounds like we have consensus on supporting the event, whether or not we can staff the table, would it potentially be an option for us to pay a registration fee and in the event we are unable to staff it, donate that table space then to another organization that might then want to use it for the event. I think that's a great idea. Another thing we've done in the past was we had a we had a shared table at the Latino Fest a few years ago with the seniors um, in which we literally shared a table and they had their stuff on one side and our stuff on the other and we were able to assist um, on, on covering that um, that time. So another city entity possibly. Well, and I don't know if it helps, but I'm a, I'm a proud mom. So if you're willing to open it up to staff and I would help staff the table. Oh yeah. We will open it up. I motion we open it up to staff. <laughs> <laughs> I second this motion. All right, do it. Duly noted. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I could take a few hours sitting there too. So yeah, it seems like we're gonna be sponsoring a table. We we'll have stride, and we might have somebody to sit there for yes. a couple hours. So let's put the official motion on the table then to be a vendor at the Corville Pride event happening on September fifth. So moved. I second. Okay. There we go. 
Uh, all in favor of this motion of having a table, say aye. 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 Those, aye. those opposed, say nay. Those abstaining, say aye. Motion passes 6-0. We will have a table open to staff involvement. <laughs> I didn't get who did the second. I, I believe did. Ashley oh, was. Ashley moved a second. Thank yep. you. Yep. All right. Look at us being so efficient. We love this. All right. We're down to item number seven our agenda then, which is request for transit facility letter of support, which is within the packet as well. As I scroll, scroll, scroll through my laptop. Where did it go? There are two items on here. I was transit operations and maintenance yeah. project kind of one pager and then there's actual draft of the letter to the honorable Pete Buttigieg. Yeah. Looks like the letter looks good and just need a chair to officially sign it if we approve it. Black, like I know what I'm thinking. Yeah, I um. I appreciate whoever wrote this. I'm not sure who did, but I think it makes a lot of sense for us to sort of get roped in on this issue since, I mean, we're all very aware that there are so many facets to human rights and ac accessibility to city resources and, and transportation that is um, clean and sustainable and uh, not, crumbling infrastructure I think is very important. I also appreciated that this looks like it is going, to, it's proposed to be funded with a raise grant application. I was initially concerned. I know we're all probably a little worried about how the American Rescue Plan funds are gonna be spent, but I was happy to see this was through a separate grant. Um, as I read through it personally, I fully support it. I can't see any good reason not to, but I'm open to hearing others thoughts on the commission. I so heartily support it as well. I think it's, it can only benefit our community. And uh, like with Ashley, he also will address a lot of the human rights issues. So. Any further discussion from commissioners or I'll entertain a motion um, on this topic. I'm also in support of the um, the grants. Usually, would you like to make a formal motion? Sorry, I didn't hear it. What did you say? Oh, I was putting you on the spot. I said, would you like to make a formal motion to approve the letter as written on behalf of the Human Rights Commission? Oh, uh, sure. What, what do I say? So moved. Okay. First by Bijou. Second. Second by Ashley. Um, all those in favor of passing the draft as written to request funds from the raised grant uh, for replacement of the transit facility say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Those abstained say aye. Motion passes 6-0, motion by Bijou, second by Ashley. Thank you, Bijou. <laughs> Thank you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're wonderful. All right, going down to item number eight on our agenda for the evening discussion on including a land acknowledgement as part of the HRC meetings. Um, Ashley, I believe you've been spearheading this, if I'm not correct, and if I am incorrect, I apologize, but I, I was not tasked with this, so whoever was may take it away. That is correct. Um, so there's, it's still, the wheels are still turning, the ball is still in motion, there's not a whole lot in terms of updates for a um, conclusive final draft yet um, for the land acknowledgement. I'm hoping that will be seen in our near future. 
Um, as it stands, though, I, I think this is safe to tie into item eight. Uh, for some of the events that we have hosted this past month, we have been using a land acknowledgement um, just in, in the draft form, the, the shorter draft form of what was proposed earlier. So I am still in support of having one. I will stay on top of any updates and get them back to the commission as they come. Hopefully this next month we'll, we'll have something more, more concrete. Thank you, Ashley. Have you, I just wanna ask, have we heard of any opposition towards having a land acknowledgement in general? Generally, no. I think the only hang up right now is how to make the wording um, more inclusive and equitable and respectful toward those folks uh, to whom are being discussed in the land acknowledgement. So figuring out the, the names of the First Nations that we are including and Indigenous peoples, a lot of that is, is still getting hammered out. And with input now from uh, Native Americans here in the state, particularly the Meskwaki, uh, I think we're, we're gonna make some really good headway on that. Thank you so much, Ashley, for the time and the time of others that have been dedicating to this. Um, I'm gonna give a second pause. I talk a lot, make sure that everybody has a moment to speak. So is this something that needs to move on to the next month agenda then? Yes. Okay. If, if there's a draft, a final draft submitted for our approval, it'll be on the next item and it'll be for a vote on including. If that okay. occurs, further discussion upon the draft, it will be less discussion. So Ashley and group, whenever that does get more solidified, that will be sent to Stephanie and potentially Kristen to be included within our packet. Sounds good. All right, those were your seconds. Now we're going on. <laughs> going on to subcommittees. Housing is first in our subcommittees discussion. I believe that subcommittee is Jason, Adil, and Mark, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think I am one of them. <laughs> No, okay. I misspoke. Sorry, Adil. I know you were on it in the previous cycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. With none of those members um, being here, we'll move along to the anti racism subcommittee. Well, you want to start, Roger? <laughs> I'll let uh, Ashley share a lot of things we got working on. You know, in the, sub, in the anti racism subcommittee, we're doing the summer series, which we started on June 3rd with the screening of the right privilege. It was well intended again, and we had some great question. Uh, we have our second event coming up next Monday, which is June 28th, and we will be screening uh, Stonewall, which is a great movie. And we have actually, actually recruited some great panelists to be on that event, which is amazing. So we are uh, working on advertising for that. Actually, Kristen sent out a flyer out today. So we we'll love for you guys, commissioners, to be able to share this event so we can get more people. Uh, I'm actually going to call out on our commissioner that we need to be more involved in some of those things that we're getting our community involved. And we have to be involved as well to, to start heading this. We're still doing the uh, the Iowa City Bias Challenge, which uh, we'll be putting out some new faces out there that have returned their picture with their answer. We are also following up on some of the people that agreed to do it, but they haven't sent in their stuff yet. Uh, we got some uh, big names that agreed to do it. Uh, we got the city manager, Jeff, already sending her staff. We got some uh, Iowa City School board member Lisa Williams sending her staff. We have uh, uh, Matt Degners agreed to do it. He hasn't sent staff yet. We also got uh, the new police chief agreed to do it, hasn't sent staff yet. So we got good people out there, great people out there. This is just a way to promote and invite people to take the Harvard 
implicit bias challenge, bias challenge to give people to kind of know their bias so we can continue the conversation uh, with the, you know, Black Lives Matter and all the, you know, the anti-hate, uh, Asian hate and uh, LGBTQ. Uh, so it's a lot of things, a lot of good things going on. Ashley has been working very hard on this. You guys got to give her credit. I don't know how she does some of this stuff. So, um, so the anti-racism committee is really working hard on putting on great summer series. We already started discussing some of the events that we're going to have in July and August. So those will come out as we get those finalized. And the staff are helping great. Kristen and Stephanie just been rock star on the feedback we're getting from them and putting things together, the survey that we're going to do, and just some of the amazing things they're doing on their part as well. So thank you. Did I miss anything? I kind of rumble. No, I think you covered a lot of it. Um, you, you touched on all the big notes that I wrote for myself. I think the only thing I would say is just to second everything Roger said, um, and encourage all of you, I'm going to, to task you with some homework. I would really love it if we had full engagement from the commission on the IC bias challenge. Um, we've got instructions on how to take it on the beautiful, amazing webpage that the city provided us with. Thanks to our amazing staff for getting that up and going. It's icgov.org slash bias challenge. Yeah. Um, we will, as Roger said, we're going to be sending out a survey. We just got it finalized to collect responses for that as well. Um, so that way we can start having some uh, tangible metrics and all those fun things that people like to figure out who's engaging, what they take away from it, um, and hopefully what we can do to keep perpetuating this conversation because the goal of all of this with the implicit bias summer series is to just help raise people's awareness of of the issue of implicit bias and how it it intersects with so many of these other issues we're seeing so i'm really excited i have to thank roger again for helping me with some of the heavy lifting i i really wouldn't be sleeping ever without you so thank you <laughs> And thank you also to Stephanie and Kristen for everything they've done um, and the other city staff that they've been working with through the communications department to uh, get all of our amazing marketing materials and all that stuff out there. But I will pass along um, information with links and all that fun stuff to Stephanie or Kristen, and then they can share it with the larger commission. So you have everything right at your fingertips to be able to participate. It really would be great for commissioner to take 10 15 minutes to take a, a one of those uh, tests and you don't want to share the answer with us, but just share with us what you learn from it and take your snapshot so we can blast it on all of our communication. The more we can get people taking those tests, the more people can get in, be involved in it, so. Are we allowed to ask questions? I yes. I think so. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for both of you from the uh, JC chapter of UNA uh, for the white privilege that you guys had uh, from Jim. I think you heard from him before. They were really honored to be partnering with you guys uh, about that. And um, we actually discussed about it and it was great. Um, but I also have a question on the bias challenge. What are your, who are your targets? Because I know Roger say I had big names that are taking it. Like who else are you targeting to take that survey and uh, for the bias challenge? So our, our, our first target was to get some of the community leaders to get out there. We got, you know, like the mayors, we got the city manager. We wanted to get the superintendent. So if we can get some of those uh, city leaders to be the first one to take it and have their face out there and saying that they took the test, then maybe they can start encouraging their uh, support, their direct support. We, we ask uh, the whole city council to take it. I know we, we got Laura's. Uh, Laura back. did, yeah. And uh, then we asking some of the city attorneys to take it. So. We, we wanted to look at the community leaders. We sent send some to the CEO of uh, University of Iowa and a uh, couple more community leaders here. So we're looking at 
if we can have community leaders to take it, then they can pass it on to the organization and then we can keep pushing it down. And uh, then we can push it to the school, we can, you know, to the, the kids. We, anybody really can take those tests. Anybody can take it. But we just wanted to highlight the uh, people who are the leaders of the community stepping up there. I took the bias challenge. This is what I think of it. And I challenge you to take it too. I think that was the initial idea. And I would add to that also, in addition to that uh, perspective and approach, which was definitely one of our first thoughts in starting it, I think another thing we wanted to do was ensure that we were making folks who were in positions of power aware of this issue. So not only to, to leverage their power to be able to share it and create buy-in and all that stuff, but also when we look at these oppressive systems and, and systemic racism and systemic sexism, any, any of the systemic issues we see, it's the folks in power that really need to be aware of the issues and be a part of the change to, to make things start to shift um, and become more equitable. So I think that was, that was also a main goal in who we reached out to, particularly like with, with the new police chief, you know, we want to make sure that the culture that is uh, being nurtured within the ICPB is one where it's okay for folks to be aware of implicit bias, to not feel like it's a bad word, um, especially in light of all of the uh, laws and legislation that we've seen passed at the state level. Um, just because it's not technically legal uh, to have mandated implicit bias training anymore as a, a city department or a city government doesn't mean that we can't push it through in other ways. You guys rock. I'm just gonna yeah. throw out. Thank you for that. I'm sorry I'm asking again and I keep on pushing. I think I saw what um, Roger was featured and I got to share that because it's on Facebook and I understand you guys are hitting the community leader, the big people, the big names, but there's also like other organization, like maybe I'm just gonna say uh, the, what do you call the, oh, I forgot the name and I just, Dan, uh, Dan and Chia, you know, the cemetery is one that is serving a lot of um, immigrants and refugees. And I saw, and I know this is funeral home, but he's well known in the community because he's serving this immigrants and refugees. If you can ask him, he's also a community leader because he helped out in a different way. You know, like some big names, like uh, I'm just putting Peter out there because Roger know him is uh, used to be the president of the Congolese. Uh, I think why he said the people in the Congolese community will relate to him as well. You know, so when you put the chief of police, yes, of course, but not everybody will be relating to his answer, what he's going to say or the mayor yes the african-american community will do roger yours was gone <laughs> in the Congolese community people were related from what you say it touched them and so I, I i get it and i understand it and you know like the university of iowa and it's good but it's like i'm just talking about the community the people actually that will understand those people as well please don't forget about them you know like the leaders in churches, you know, like big pastors or, you know, something like that. Uh, just so you touch everybody. That was just. Thanks for that, Bijou. And, and that's exactly why I think as commissioner, we have so many link. If we can also be involved and pass it on to our network, that'd be great. So yeah, I don't mind sending it to any of those people. If you want to share contact, we can target the person because we're making each of those invitations uh, a personal invitation. So it's not just a blast email to everybody because people will always ignore that. But if we can target each person and you want to share some of those contacts with us, we'll, 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 we will send those emails, we'll invite them to take it. I know Ashley sent so many emails and they probably you know, took a whole day just to send the email that she was sending because we're making each of those invitation personal, so uh, we're not just sending people chain letters. So I, I totally agree with you, Biju. If we need to reach people in the uh, Congolese community and the you know the Latin American community, and if we can get contact, just shoot us an email. Say this is the person that 
we think you should send it to and we'll do all the layer work. I would add to that also. Um, we are, as Roger stated, we are trying very hard to work smarter, not harder, <laughs> because this is such a this is such a massive project, and we want it to have as broad a reach as it can possibly have. And to um, address what you brought up, Bijou, because I do very much agree, we are not quite three weeks into this series now. It's going for three months, um, and phase one was reaching out to those leaders in our community. Roger and I had always had the plan once we move into phase two, which is sort of where we're, where we're at now, especially with this survey to be able to share, we're going to be sending the link to that out yeah. to all of our different uh, networks. So for me, that's going to involve a lot of the nonprofits here in town. I'm going to be sending it to my contacts at UAY. I'm going to be sending it to my contacts at DVIP. I'm going to reach out to RVAP. Um, so we're going to really start leveraging those networks to reach out to those other folks, like you said, that um, people might feel more inspired by by their personal perspective that they share to to go out and and take the challenge and and join us on that. So. Please do, like Roger said, share with us any contacts that you think might be useful. We know that everybody that's in this room has a, a vast network of folks who I'm sure would be more than happy to be a part of this challenge. So yeah, either pass it along to Roger, pass it along to me, and we will make sure the right information gets to the right people. And also to add to Ashley, because of the magnitude of this project that's why we're sharing a lot of those things that's why the city created a page for it so it's not just in our own uh network so if you're putting it in the city page we can also refer people to that page and now uh, and they can take the test so because the links are there thank you Excellent work, guys. I'm trying to bring up the agenda again. Um, we're gonna move to the Health Equity Subcommittee. Um, I'll be honest, we haven't been able to meet. Um, so I will move on to item number 10 on our agenda, which is commission statement in support of Black Lives Matter. And that could also be inclusive of the statement that the city of Iowa City has put out. Um, which was on June 17th as well. But as Kristen has pulled up here is what we have discussed and reworked. So yeah, at the last meeting, it was asked of the commission to send any suggestions for tweaks or um, alternate wording, things that might make this statement better um, and more potentially more impactful. I, I want to commend Roger again for creating this initial draft. It was so just so beautiful. <laughs> I was so moved the first time I heard it and I was I was very appreciative to have his perspective in um, getting this written up. We, as far as I understand and correct me if I'm wrong, Roger, I don't think we received any feedback from anyone on the commission outside of that last meeting. Is that correct? No, I have not got any feedback yet. Yeah, so what we ended up doing because uh, Mark was also exceptionally uh, overbooked with his time, uh, we just parsed things down, took out um, the, the comment areas that were in there before, and yeah, basically just condensed it down a little bit, but the, the heart of it is all the same. The, um, the language is all still the same. So we propose this, I guess, as a final draft and are open to comment on it. Otherwise, I suppose we can potentially vote to approve tonight. I think it looks great. I think you guys obviously put in a lot of time and thought to this, even on the first draft, I thought it was really well done. Um, I okay with entertaining a motion on this or for further discussion? I also think it looks good. And thank you so much for all the hard work you guys have been putting on this. Even the, the previous one, just like Jessica said, it, it looks great. Um, so thank you for all the work on 
on behalf of all of us. <laughs> I guess I will put out a formal motion to approve the final draft of the Black Lives Matter statement from the HRC. Do I have a second? I second, hey, Tony. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Was that Tony? Yeah, yeah, I second. Excellent. So first by Jessica, second by Tony. Um, all those in favor of adopting this say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Those abstaining, please say nay. Motion passes six to zero. Well done. Thank you again. I feel like Ashley and Roger are putting in some real work here, guys. Um, moving on to item number 11, which I am unaware if we have full updates on this, which is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We, um, we were waiting on collaboration support from um, United Nations, I believe. Is that correct? We will be meeting this week with okay. the Johnson County United Nations Association and the Senior Center um, on developing a program. Uh, but I think it's in the early stages. OK. Uh, I believe we will just place that on our July meeting agenda then, Kristen, to have discussion based upon what comes out of their meeting. Um, moving along to item number 12, which is the Social Justice Racial Equity Grant Reports. Um, and I believe Chris can, Kristen can pull up the one that has been submitted by the Center for Worker Justice. Yes. Yep. Um, I think this was to be submitted on last month, they were delayed by a month in getting it to Stephanie. Um, has their description of background, recent events, and expenditures. Again, this is to support their social enterprise project, which is supporting young entrepreneurs in their culinary skills. Um, through the center. I like the reports. I appreciate the detail. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> they add so much, um, yeah. the, those little human details into yeah. their reports, which I just love. And I'm always so impressed with how the Center for Worker Justice leverages partnerships and just um, creative thinking and, and creative solutions in the face of adversity to be able to get the work done that they want to get done. I am trying to find it here, but I really appreciated the part where they were talking about how they had uh, had a couple folks in the program that were individually uh, selling their various uh, yeah. specific yeah. items that they specialized in and just how successful that had been. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a really great report and I'm happy to see the work they're doing. I just appreciate an organization, a community making the difference in people's lives by promoting them. So it's great to see. And I know they're gonna be kicking the ground off and running here as, as we said, COVID has slowly subsided. I know that they're gonna be doing more events that can be supported either by the commission or just by city residents as well. Awesome, awesome to hear. And all is like, welcome to volunteer always. And I think we'll be expecting more of these social justice racial equity grant reports in the upcoming month as they will be due um, for fiscal year 21. Um, so we'll be expecting more in July and August for final reports. Um, last but not least, we have staffing commission announcements. Um, Please remember that commissioners shall not engage in discussion with one another concerning said announcements, but we'll start with staff updates. If Kristen or 
Kristen Bailu of Stephanie have anything to share with the commission? Um, I don't. No, I'm I don't. So happy you're here. Adil, did you have any announcements? No, no, I didn't. Uh, okay, Jason, nope, sorry, Ashley. Uh, yes, so last week, I, I've been keeping an eye on the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights programming that they've been doing. And last week, they finally had their Truth and Reconciliation event talking about truth and reconciliation in Iowa City and the world. And it was just an incredible event. Um, I learned so much, even, even having been a part of the human rights working group where we've been talking a lot about TRCs and, and what our local TRC is doing and all the work related to their mission and goals. I learned a lot about TRC processes as a whole, what they can look like throughout the world um, and what, based off of all of that information, how we might be hopeful in the situation that we have currently with both a city TRC and a people's TRC. So uh, it, it was very well attended from my understanding and they did record it. So if folks weren't able to attend last week, um, you can find the recording of that webinar on their website and I would highly encourage everybody to check it out. Awesome, thank you, Ashley. Uh, any updates, Roger? Uh, you know, this uh, week I've been attending some of, last week actually, I've been attending some of the Juneteenth activity throughout the city, and there were some great ones. So the Black Party was uh, well intended. It was nice to see people out there, people coming out, just enjoying the event. And uh, I also attended the, the first diversity market, which was great to actually see some of those vendors and, and the people selling things. I think if we can just promote more things like that to our, our community, uh, it will be great. And uh, finally, well, we have our uh, Stonewall Forever event screening this coming Monday, the 28th, starting at 6 p.m. So we hope to see you out there. We hope you pass on uh, this uh, to many people in the community. And uh, we can have a great turnout and continue with this summer series on uh, implicit, implicit bias. Awesome, thank you, Roger. Uh, Bijou, any updates? Yeah, first I just wanna say thank you to every one of you for what you guys been doing, not just coming to these meetings, but in the community and your involvement. Um, sorry, Jessica, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for your support and the community in, in like almost everything you there. And I know you're very busy. We're very busy with school and your job, but you always, you know, like in support of all the events that go on. And I know every one of you actually do. Um, I know last month I attended the uh, refugees in uh, Iowa City. Women refugees in Iowa City are now planning a monthly or every other month event where women just celebrate women uh, just not being, you know, being in home, domestic violence, or just the right as women. You know, like I know it's Women Days, Women Mother's Days, but they just want to have this moment where they just come together, cook and dance, and then just relax for five minutes because most of, um, um, I'll say immigrants and refugees, women don't really have right. Back home, they didn't. And here in America, where there is also, you know, like freedom of rights, they really don't in their homes with their husbands and, and stuff. So the little moments that they have, they just want to celebrate to just get out for five minutes. So I attended uh, one or two other events and we decided with those events, we probably just going to start empowering these women or encouraging them or their dreams of what they're trying to do with the permission of their husbands. Of course, Roger, you know how it goes <laughs> with African men's. Um, so I'll be sending you guys an invitation and I will appreciate it if you guys can join. I uh, will make like a, a panel thing where 
they drink, they eat, you know, like, uh, and then we talk, like, an education thing. Like, you guys can come as human rights and just speak to them about their rights as women or, you know, just to encourage them. Or you can come as an individual and just tell a three minutes of your story, you know, as a woman or what happened to you um, uh, as a woman. So we're going to have that event uh, it's supposed to be the last Saturday of July, but there's so many events going on. So we might postpone it to the first Saturday of August. And this is people will be talking about the, the experience during pandemic, you know, when you were home, you know, your experience and stuff. Uh, so and men are welcome to come. Uh, it's going to be more women speaking. We'll have different people, um, doctors that will talk. I will appreciate if as human rights commissioner, if we can come and, and speak to them and encourage them. They, actually, they will appreciate that too. Um, or just to come and sit and hear their stories. Um, Another thing that I would like to say is I, I, I know everybody's busy and everybody's already involved in something, but it will be nice if we can just take time to even contact some organizations. Like I'm going to name Funeral Home, like the Dan and Shia Funeral Home uh, in um, Iowa City. I volunteer there. Actually, I work there sometimes and I've learned so much just to have people mourning the loss of their loved ones and be there to uh, support them. And sometimes with the violence that's going on in the community, you don't hear what goes on, but when you go to this event or when you go and supporting them, you, you understand what's going on and you might find out the solution. Um, I want to contact the police department. So I'll be contacting Daisy, I believe, or the chief of the police to see, to make, them trying to see if they can be involved sometimes. I don't know what the rules and regulations are, even the mayor, because you might find out a lot of information or that can help the community trust us more or trust them more when there's a situation like this. Um, I know Jessica and I have talked about this before and thank you so much, Jessica, for always listening to me. But um, I just wanna encourage everybody besides your work, if you have five minutes, 10 minutes, I know this is America, but Roger knows this. As African, we don't care if that's not our family, if there's an event or if there's something we attend. Uh, funeral, we just go to support, to, to, to be there, comfort for somebody. There's a lot of um, issue right now with domestic violence. There's a lot of uh, issue with gun violence in Iowa City, a whole lot. and. Um, you, you hear things in a community that they won't tell the police or they won't tell anybody, but it's, it's very resourceful to know where the cause is so we can figure out how to fix it before it happens next time. And also seeing maybe the mayor or the chief of police, not in uniform or any police, not in uniform to just be in support, maybe, you know, to build that relationship. All the human rights, it doesn't have to be them, any of you guys, because, you know, you're representing, you know, the city to just, and support this communities in their event or whatever they, they're doing, it, it will help to try to solve these issues. So we, we minimize crime or, you know, violence or whatever is going on. Um, so I'm just encouraging everybody to, to, kind of be more involved if you have time, when you have time. Thank you, Bijou. Tony, do you have any updates? Uh, I mean, I attended a couple of Juneteenth events this past week um, with Roger for one on one Thursday and then um, IFR is one on Saturday. Pride, we had a couple of events. It's been kind of busy this month with Pride stuff, but um, I am hosting a LGBTQ inclusive training this Friday at noon uh, via Zoom with One Iowa. If anyone's interested, it's really good for workplace um, inclusive training. Um, I can email everyone that link. Um, it's, a, it's a really good one. Um, co my coworker, Max, is the one. He will be leading it. Um, he is amazing at it. I'm, I'm learning everything I need for this training to do my own training for it from, from them. So 
Uh, I'll email everyone that link. So that's about it. Thank you, Tony. Um, I don't have very many updates. I did attend the first diversity market. I was unable to attend this weekend uh, as I was out of town with my stepdaughter's soccer. Um, but the first diversity market was awesome. So I encourage everybody to attend those in the South neighborhood. Um, another thing is I've been volunteering with CWJ and one of the last meetings that I had over there was actually with Iowa Legal Aid and Sarah Barron from the Housing Coalition, Affordable Housing Coalition for Johnson County, um, talking about how the CDC moratorium and evictions are going to actually start rolling through our court systems. And there's a process through Iowa Legal Aid in which you as an individual um, can get assistance with at least one month's rent in order to avoid being evicted from the property in which you are renting. Um, you should be able to contact you or anybody that you know within your circle should be able to contact Iowa Legal Aid. And they should also be having representatives at the Johnson County Courthouse to help fill out any IFA, Iowa Finance Authority applications for rental assistance or back utility assistance. So there is still funding available out there for individuals that are housing insecure. Um, and especially as the discriminatory Section 8 uh, policy has been repealed over the state. So now starting in 2022, individuals that have certain sources of income may be discriminated against um, is, it, is a thing now. Um, we may see an increase in other sorts of biases in the housing market. So I just want everybody to kind of be aware um, of, of some rising issues that are within our community and across the state. Uh, Iowa Legal Aid said that normally their workload is between 20 to 30 percent of evictions and at, right now it's over 40 percent of their workload is dealing with just evictions of Iowans, um, especially low-income Iowans that they serve. So I've also taken a, an additional graduate research assistantship opportunity for the summer. Yes, I'm very busy. Um, and it is assisting with the legislators in order to change protections for individuals uh, that reside in mobile home parks across the state. And so if you want any more information on that, um, feel free to email me, Facebook me, find me anywhere that you can. And I'd be more than happy to discuss or get you involved in the advocacy that's gonna happen with the Labor Center, maybe with CWJ as well, and then also with the College of Law and the Legal Clinic. So those are my updates. Um, did I miss anyone or does anybody have additional comments they would like to add? Jessica, I, I know I said I didn't have anything, but once you mentioned eviction, um, the memo on evictions came out today and caused all three local reporters from all three local networks to um, contact the office and ask for interviews on the memo. So um, there's going to be a lot of publicity about that coming up in the next few days. Um, we wrote a, we published a memo on pretext for evictions. Um, basically, the eviction moratorium is ending for non-payment of rent, but if a landlord wants to um, use that as an excuse, uh, if they're willing to work with one tenant and not willing to work with another tenant, that could be before discriminatory reason. Um, so if anybody hears anything or um, as you're out and about, please encourage people to call because sometimes the, the stated reason isn't the real reason. Sometimes the, if the landlord is saying, well, you haven't paid your rent, what they really mean is I don't want you as a tenant. I'll work with other people, but I won't work with you. Um, so, you know, just have that in the back of your head if you hear anything or if you're talking to people. We're here to investigate, um, you know, whether the motive is a pretext for discrimination. And also, if Tony was talking about Max Moitz, I would take any class that Max um, offers. Max is like an absolutely fantastic teacher. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm, Max has a gift for teaching. So <laughs> if you can find a Max class, take it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, 
with all of those updates from staff and commissioners, I believe that we are done with our meeting for today at about 6.59 p.m. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I second. Okay. Oh, I think Adele beat you to the punch, Bijou. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Motion by Roger, a second by both Adele and then by Bijou. <laughs> all righty. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Kristen, for getting to wrangle us all together on this lovely Tuesday evening.